let's talk about some other forces uh, involved in that loss of trust, which is the misinformation that is out there, the strange public conversation in which suddenly people who never thought about biology are talking about fur and cleavage sites and gain of function research. And how do you how do you explain the fact that I get text messages during the pandemic from pretty bright people on Wall Street? who I know I went to college with or have known who are saying, Oh, you know, doesn't the Fuhrer and cleavage site, you know, issue become a smoking gun for the lab leak theory. Like why do really smart people actually, in some cases go for uh, low hanging fruit conspiracy theories. Right. So what you're referring to is this, there's a book by Alina Chan and Matt Ridley called viral, which makes that point that this must've been a lab leak. This must've been lab created, but because if you're in cleavage site, which is important for the, for the cleavage of which allows the virus to enter the cell, um, that, that, um, that doesn't exist in nature. And therefore it has to, um, has to have been man-made. First of all, it does exist in nature. And, and so that was wrong, but um, I think, you know, there's this, I, I'm not sure I know exactly the answer to your question, but I'm going to make this offer. There is a Wikipedia site um, called Nobel Prize Disease. And, and the, the point of that site is that they're, they, they go through a number of Nobel Prize winners who have these just sort of outlandish beliefs, either, either sort of false beliefs or biases or conspiracy theories. And the point that they're trying to make, and there's like a fairly large psychological literature on this now, that people who are really smart, are really accomplished are actually more susceptible to false beliefs uh, for a variety of reasons. So maybe that's it for whatever reason that you, you, you're you so accomplished in one field that you feel you can master any other. But I also think it's possible that a lot of these Nobel laureates are people who had the experience of being right when everyone else was wrong. That's why they got a Nobel. And so that experience saying, I can see through the through the smoke and mirrors and the and to see the truth, I think it's a it's an addictive feeling. I would imagine. So I think that probably explains some of it. Um, but that said, you also have minds of people who, again, ostensibly are prepared to do science. People who graduated with PhDs or who are MDs. Some of them are in the United States Senate. Some of them are Surgeon Generals of states. How do, when you think about some of the misinformation that comes out of the mouths of these individuals, other than you know pulling out any hair you may have lying around, what, what how do you how do you process like what their day feels like? Like you you know you're a senator and you get up in the morning and you say I'm going to go put Tony Fauci on the stand and and tell him you know obviously it's a this is a lab leak and anyone who says otherwise is wrong. Like what is motivating that in your view? Uh, to, to people to do that. Because I don't actually believe that people get up in the morning and say, how can I hurt people today? Uh, oh, I know, I'll tell them that vaccines cause autism. I think that they're driven by something else. How do you think about those individuals? Well, I think it, 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 among politicians, whether it's, it's senators like Ron Johnson or, or congressmen like Marjorie Taylor Greene or Matt Gates, I think they're, they're in the let's just throw away the federal government mode right now, and we'll do everything we can to do that. I mean, so everything becomes political. So if you can sort of nail Tony Fauci down for the fact that the Obama administration gave money to the Wuhan Institute of Virology to study coronaviruses, because it's in that area, a large metropolitan area in central China that that uh, where there's a lot of commerce, where uh, uh, that this kind of animal to human spillover event would occur. It's just very easy to offer that conspiracy theory, which is conspiracy theories are seductive. They're very easy to understand. They're just wrong. And, and so, so everything becomes political. And it's, it's really sad to watch because it's really important to understand how these animal to human spillover events occur. And so that we, the next one won't occur. And we do everything we can to just confuse people. It is hard to watch. And the, the hardest part for me is when you see, you know, people well recognized scientists or clinicians like Peter McCullough, for example, or Robert Malone, or, or a Marty Macri who get up in front of Congress or whatever and say, you know, that, that this, you know, that the DNA fragments in mRNA vaccines insert themselves into your DNA and cause cancer, or we all know it's a lab leak, it's a no-brainer, um, or in the case of Peter McCullough, that the spike protein is toxic, and, and they're telling people what they want to hear, and unfortunately, they're doing it with the platform or with the imprimatur of being an MD or a PhD or both. It's hard to watch. What are the, I just wonder what it is that they think they're doing, but I guess it's just hard to imagine. But I also think there's a cognitive dissonance between the, oh, the, the, this was created in a Chinese lab and the Chinese government must be held accountable. But by the way, it's just a cold. <laughs> right. 
Well, well, first of all, I think the Chinese government should be held accountable to some extent. I mean, they, they there was in that western section of the Hunan wholesale seafood market several dozen animals that were sold illegally. They were all sort of housed in in, in unsanitary, close conditions. I mean, it was ripe for a, an animal to human spillover event to occur, much as it did with SARS one in two thousand two, and 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 that in combination with the fact that the Chinese government was loath initially to let an international team of scientists come in and evaluate what was going on there, just sort of fueled conspiracy theories. They weren't a good player here. You shouldn't have had to depend on a whistleblower in China to tell you that there was a virus that was circulating and, and killing people. A man who became a hero ultimately and posthumously because he died from this virus, but it shouldn't come to that. Yeah. But then I also think about people who I think mean well, they were in positions of power. I'm thinking particularly of an anecdote uh, that you talk about, Stephen Hahn, the FDA commissioner at the time, getting in front of cameras, blatantly misreading the, the literature on, on convalescent plasma, you know, doing an apology tour the next day. But actually, if you think about what he said in the, in the days that came after, still his statement doesn't make sense. The relative risk reduction, as opposed to an absolute risk reduction, was dredged from a subgroup of a subgroup. Like, why do people, and I don't know Stephen Hahn, but I know people who say he's a smart guy. Um, why do people like, like, like the FDA commissioner get into, make mistakes like that? That was the saddest part of this whole four years for me. I mean, um, I was asked by Francis Collins to be part of this so-called active group accelerating COVID uh, technological innovations and vaccines and in combination with being on the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee. So I had to some extent a, a closer look at what was going on with the FDA and to some extent the CDC because I'd been on the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practice. And, and I love those people. I love people at the FDA and CDC. I think they really wanted to get things right and do, they're, they're public servants who are trying to do good. But what happened starting really in April of 2020 was you saw a real politicization of those organizations. I mean, when the, the Trump administration wanted a magic medicine for this pandemic to go away, they settled on hydroxychloroquine, an anti-malarial drug. And, and that they were able to twist the arm of the FDA to basically um, authorize it. And so the government bought 29 million doses of, of hydroxychloroquine. And, and then studies were done showing clearly that hydroxychloroquine didn't work to treat or prevent the disease. And so three months later, they then withdrew that authorization. That looked terrible. That was a sad day for health the human services and the FDA. And people got scared, me included. I, I wrote an op-ed piece with Zeke Emanuel in the New York Times, fearing an October surprise, fearing that the Trump administration would also twist the arm of the FDA to authorize vaccines before they had been adequately tested for safety or efficacy. And um, and states, number of states formed their own vaccine advisory committees because they didn't trust the FDA either. And that was all understandable. I mean, Dr. Hunt, to his credit, did stand up to the Trump administration and, and allow us to have a two month safety follow up after the last dose of vaccine, which then pushed that authorization into December, which was a month after the election because Donald Trump had pulled Stephen Hahn into his office and, and an invective laden tirade had said, you have got to approve this or authorize this vaccine before the election. And he didn't do it to his credit. So he didn't stand up on the hydroxychloroquine, but he did stand up, I think, on the vaccine. So um, that was good to see. Let's close with a little bit of a conversation about the public conversation uh, that scientists and researchers and physicians like yourself have are having and the idea of how and where we should engage. You obviously have been outspoken pro-vaccine, but also with some nuance saying, look, it's not, we don't have to just repeat the talking points of pharmaceutical companies who at some point have a different interest. Uh, sometimes they align with public health and sometimes there's a little bit less alignment. And you've been out there saying, look, these vaccines are miracles and they're great, but they're you know, we have to be thoughtful about them. Um, and you've gotten criticism for that. Uh, but on the other hand, if you go on Joe Rogan's show, uh, like, like, you know, Dr. Sanjay Gupta, who I really like and admire in a lot of ways, if you do that, you often uh, regret it. So where, where should we, where should we be having these conversations to reach the people we need to reach? That's a great question. I would say this. Um, Sort of growing up in in the world of science, working on rotaviruses, you know, when when you would you would present at a national meeting, you drew a conclusion based on your data, and so you would be criticized, and you wanted to be criticized. You wanted people to say, "Look, I don't think you can say these two surface proteins are both equally able to invoke neutralizing antibodies because you didn't do this control or that control," and that's good because that makes your science better. 
that kind of public debate regarding science, or in this case, the science behind a, a policy uh, recommendation does not work well in public policy. It doesn't. I mean, uh, for me, the, those those examples included in August of 2021, when President Biden stood up and said, as of a month from now, we're going to have a third dose for everybody over 12, 12 uh, years of age. And it's kind of like, what? I mean, where did that come from? And then we meet a month later as an emergency meeting at the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee to go through the data, which were unimpressive. Um, or the bivalent vaccine was, you know, it was a step sideways. It, it wasn't a bad idea. Um, it didn't work out to be any better than the monovalent vaccine we had. And it's okay to say that. I think it's okay to say that you didn't get it right the first time. Science is a process of evolution. You learn as you go. And I just think we have to be much better at explaining that to people and explain every other day or every third day the CDC gets gets out there with at the time Rochelle Walensky and, and says, Look, here's what we know now. Here's what we're planning on doing. I'll, I'll tell you an interesting story. The um, In 2009, we had a swine flu pandemic. And at the time, Richard Besser was the head of the CDC. And he was great. He was out there every other day talking about, here's what the vaccine can and can't do. Here's, what we're, we're, here's where we are in this pandemic. And I saw him at a recent meeting, and I said, that, you were great. He said, thank you. I could never do it today. Two reasons, politics and social media. So I think that's what you're up against that you weren't up against, I think, uh, in the past year, it's sort of like you're on the bus or you're off the bus, to quote Ken Kesey. And the minute that you you have any sort of uh, counter to the science behind a particular recommendation, you're off the bus and, and people um, uh, get angry with you. Well, your book is a fascinating review of both the pandemic and the problem of information and misinformation. It's called Tell Me When It's Over, an insider's guide to deciphering COVID myths and navigating our post-pandemic world. Dr. Paul Offit, thanks for joining us. Thank you.